the four horsemen. And so we're going to continue forward here um, in that part of Revelation chapter 6. And I want to draw some attention to some things that I believe the Lord would have us to look at. So Revelation chapter 6, we're going to begin in the fifth seal. As you guys remember, that's where we ended. So let's look at that together, and, and I want to break down some things as we look at it. So it says um, that, verse 9, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were, was completed. Let me just say a, a, a few things, a couple things about this. Uh, number one, obviously, is um, this special recognition and we see that throughout the New Testament. There are different rewards for different levels of faithfulness. Uh, we see that obviously with the talents from the five to the two. Um, but other places as well, we see the crowns, the crown of life promised to those who endure temptation, uh, the crown of rejoicing to those that uh, see souls come to the Lord, the incorruptible crown of 1 Corinthians 9 to those that discipline their bodies discipline their lives for the sake of souls. Um, we see also, um, uh, what, what are the crown? The crown of glory, 1 Peter 5, to faithful pastors. And so these are different rewards that God gives, and there's a specific reward it's, it looks to for the martyrs. And this is just the justice and the graciousness of our God that he specifically um, seeks to honor and, and to reward those who are faithful to him. And he has a special reward for each person, and we need to honor that. Um, my, my mind usually goes to Matthew chapter 20, where we see the one that's uh, not happy that he, they worked all day and they didn't get the um, same reward as those who come at the end. But the point is that he says, I'm good, and I give it as I want. I gave you what I said I was going to give you. And so we see the goodness of God as he recognizes and gives reward. We see that throughout the, earth, the, the churches of Revelation as well. They're given specific rewards for their faithfulness to overcome. So the second thing I want to point out about this is why is there judgment? And this is partly answered right here by uh, the text that God gives judgment because there must be justice for the sins that have taken place, including the shedding of blood of his saints. I want to draw attention to a passage in Matthew chapter 23 concerning this because this is really what we see in, in Scripture um, in the way that God judges. We see this again also in Romans chapter 2 where it says uh, that wrath is being stored up until that day. So when there's that the deception is, well, I'm not, I'm getting away with this. The unbeliever thinks there's nothing happening to me, therefore, you know, this, that, and the other. No, it's God's mercy. He's giving space for repentance. But if there's not repentance, wrath is being stored up. And the picture is like, is like it's behind a dam. And the dam will one day break and all that wrath will be poured out. And so God doesn't want any to perish, all to come to repentance. That's why he gives that space of repentance, that time for repentance. But it, if it is ignored, if it is rejected, then the wrath is just building. And we see that this also in Matthew 23 um, concerning even, I think this is a connection I see with the, with the blood of the martyrs, uh, because we see in uh, Matthew 23, look, if you have your Bible, I'll just, or I could just read it to you, beginning in verse 33 unto 36, he's rebuking the Pharisees. And what does he say? What does he say? Um, beginning in, what did I just say? Well, I could, we could begin verse 30. He says, If we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves, Jesus says, that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. Fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? 
Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes, and some of them, some of them you will kill and crucify, and some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city. Listen to what it says in verse 35. That on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Surely I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So we see this culmination uh, 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 that's moving to the end, the closer it comes to the end time, of more accountability and, um, and with accountability, greater judgment. As the heart, the heart is hardened and it becomes, moves to murder. And so we see this justice of God and this culmination at the end of the age uh, for the martyrs. And of course, the third thing we see here is God's sovereignty once again. This is a recurring theme throughout the book of Revelation. God is on his throne, and even the appointed number, the number of their fellow servants, until it was completed, uh, there, there will not be the full answer. And so again, we see that God is completely in control, and precious uh, in his sight are the death of his saints. And he will honor that, and he will oversee every single one um, that, that comes uh, to, to, to pass according to his will and that martyrdom. So the sixth seal, it goes on to say, I looked then and he opened the sixth seal and behold there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair and the moon became like blood and the stars of the heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it, sh it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll then it rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? And so with this one... Um, it's very interesting to me that if you if you, you would come to this place and what it's a, re a reference to when it talks about the great earthquake, the sun becoming as black, a sackcloth of hair, and the moon becoming like blood. Uh, if you want to write this down, there are some Old Testament references. The most familiar, of course, is Joel chapter 2, verse 31. But there's two others that's referring to, and that's Isaiah chapter 13, verse 10, and Isaiah 34, verse and and if you compare what's going on here to this point with Matthew 24 at least what I'm seeing it's very interesting it's like the same order that we see Jesus address in Matthew 24 about the last days in the end times if you look at Matthew 24 the first thing that Jesus addressed is the false messiahs uh, the false prophets and that would coincide with the first rider of the horse, and that being the Antichrist. And then Jesus talks about wars, uh, famine, increase of persecution. And then Jesus talks about the gospel going to every nation. That's, that includes, obviously, what we're going to read here in a second in chapter 7 uh, with the Great Tribulation. Um, and then there's the abomination of desolation that Jesus mentions, which would... Is, is what I see in the book of Revelation corresponding with Daniel is the three and a half year mark of the tribulation where the contract is broken uh, and then great deception. And then in chapter 24, verse 29, after Jesus says these things about the abomination of desolation, then he quotes exactly what the sixth seal is talking about with the sky, uh, the moon going to blood and, and the sky, the sun becoming darkened and then the, even the, the stars. And so I think that's interesting. Obviously, we're going to see it again, but you see that order that corresponds with Jesus in this. And he says um, in verse 16 that the people are going to say, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Uh, in other words, there'll be no more excuses. They're going to know exactly what's happening. The people will know that this is the day of the Lord. And uh, this is a, a the, the word that, of course, is used over and over again in the Old Testament. Um, Zephaniah is, that's the main theme of Zephaniah, the day of the Lord. And 
and uh, or the day it's called the day of great the great day or the day of wrath it says in uh, verse 14 it calls it the great day and in verse 15 of chapter 1 in Zephaniah it's called the day of wrath and and this is the day that Jesus this is what's being uh, prophesied from the Old Testament concerning this specific time and what will be unveiling in the book of Revelation uh, one thing I think is fascinating if you didn't know this is that it says here they say who can stand that's what they're saying who is able to stand and it's just interesting that there's three times um, that Paul two times Paul uses that and one time Peter uses this word stand and it's interesting it's uh, Romans 5 1 and 2 Romans 5 1 and 2 1 Corinthians 15 1 and 1 Peter 5 12 and the first two that are that Paul uses it he said that the way that we can stand specifically is by the gospel it's powerful that that Paul uses that language and this is our ability to stand before the Lord is through the gospel and then in Peter it's used about the grace of God by the grace of God we can stand and so that is the only way you and I can stand before the Lord through the gospel and by the grace of God and that's the only one any way anybody will be able to stand before God on the day of judgment and so let us be reminded of that and uh, and prepare others for that to know how they can have that assurance like we do that they can stand amen praise the Lord so let's I want to go on to uh, to chapter 7 let's look at that together uh, there's at least part of it right now. After these things I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Obviously this is supernatural, because even with the, the um, spinning of the earth, there's, there's a wind. God's supernaturally causing it to stop. And then I saw another angel ascending from the east, which would... if, if if John seeing this would be coming out from the area of where Jerusalem would be towards the rising of the sun coming out um, having the seal of the living God and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea saying do not harm the earth the sea or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads and we're going to see this in a little bit. The enemy is always an imitator. He is, he's not an originator. He's always trying to copy God. And so we're going to see that throughout the book of Revelation. And that's, of course, what he's going to do with his own servants. He's going to try to up it one by not just the forehead, but the hand as well. But the enemy always copies what God does. He's not the creator. He is he's, he's a creation and therefore... Uh, inferior to our our Lord and our God but it says that they have to be sealed and then we see specifically who it is that God seals saying God says here and I heard the number of those who were sealed 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed this is amazing again if, if, if the Bible if the if prophecy isn't taken literally uh, with, without understanding obviously the interpretation where there is symbol and it's clearly symbol and we interpret it that way then what you'll find is what happens today and what you even find with the JWs that they think that only their group has 144,000 and you have any kind of interpretation but it's clear if you just take what scripture says it's is these are Israelites these are Jews these are not Gentiles and, it, and it's, it goes down listing through there of the tribe of Judah, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Naphtali, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Ash, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin, the 12,000 from each one. These are Jews that God is sealing during the, the time of the tribulation. And, uh, and, you know, why is that? Well, I believe that God is going to have his way. He's going to fulfill his promise and he's going to see his covenant and what he intended come to pass. Even when man fails, he will not fail. Even as it says in Timothy, um, 
when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. And so if we look, I want to give you some scriptures if, if you don't know these already. What are the Old Testament scriptures on Israel being a blessing to the nations? Because this is the context. Here are a few right now I'm going to read to you. Um, what, you know, again, I was be reminded again, Romans 1.16, that uh, the gospel, Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, of the power of God and the salvation to the Jew first. First to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So this is God's heart and his desire. And of course, we're going to read here in a little bit, beginning of verse 9, that's what happens. It moves to the nation. So here, here are some verses, Old Testament passages that talk about Israel being a blessing to the nations. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. Genesis 22, verse 18. Genesis 28, verse 13 and 14. Acts chapter 3, verse 25. Galatians 3, verse 8. Isaiah 61, verse 6. Isaiah 49, verse 3. Ezekiel 37, 27 and 28. That's Ezekiel 37, verse 27 and verse 28. And then Ezekiel 39, verse 7. So these are just some of the Old Testament scriptures. Of course, the, the most uh, well-known one from the very beginning was Exodus 19, 6, where God told Israel, I'm going to make you a, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, that you're going to bless the nations around you. And so this was God's intention, and God is going to have his way. Uh, we praise the Lord. Of course, Paul talked about the mystery of the gospel. What was the mystery Paul was talking about? It was that God's, it was God's intention that it would go to all the nations. That's clearly what the mystery of the gospel is. It was not just to the Jew, but it was for every tribe, every tongue, every nation, in God's heart for the Gentiles. But even in the mystery of the gospel, we see the, the, also the Old Testament passages where Israel will be a blessing to the nations. And so what, what does it say? Well, also, I know some of you probably have picked up a notice that uh, the tribe of Dan is not mentioned. Uh, there's speculation as to why that was. Um, we, we don't, no, no one knows for certain. The speculation is uh, that it was, it was because in Judges 18, um, Dan was the tribe that led Israel into idolatry. Uh, in fact, they did it for nearly 500 years. So Judges 18, uh, 14 to 31, there's some believe that that, you know, was a consequence. But of course, in God's redemptive plan, we see that Dan ends up being, um, being blessed by God and being used in a powerful way um, in the end. But, but there is some that would tie and connect Judges 18 to why the tribe of Dan is not mentioned here. Um, so let, let's go on. So what happens during this? It says in verse 9, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number, of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders and the four living creatures and fell on their faces before the throne, saying, and fell on the throne, and worship God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed with in white robes? Where do they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor, nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the, the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the, the living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So I, I just want to, um, as we close, 
in this uh, some attention here. Um, obviously, the power of just um, this crescendo of worship uh, in three or four areas, right? From the four living creatures, we see it from the angels and from the elders, and now from these redeemed from the from the, tribu the tribulation. There are those who would say, well, uh, is there a specific time of Jacob's trouble of, you know, it says, Jesus says, you shall have trouble in the world and take courage, I'll overcome the world. And Jesus, they say, would say, constantly talks about tribulation. But I would submit to you that there's a distinction that Jesus makes about the what's called the great tribulation. And that's what I believe is being specifically talked about here in uh, chapter 7. Um in verse 14 and then Jesus also uh, says these same words in Matthew 24 21 so and it's also mentioned in Daniel chapter 12 verse 1 there seems to be a distinction between just talking about tribulation and then this great tribulation that is made so those are the scriptures that that you could look up Matthew 24 21 Daniel 12 1 and also Jeremiah 30, verse 3 through 7, which is addressing Jacob's, Jacob's trouble. Um, and so we see they're, they're waving palm branches, of course, which signify victory or triumph. And um, they're looking forward to this day uh, that of all that they have suffered, all they've endured. Again, look, think about the context. John is writing to a persecuted church. And they can look forward to this day where there will be no more suffering and that God uh, will cause them never to hunger or thirst anymore and where they will have their tears wiped from their eyes. Uh, and, and that's our comfort as well. But how much more to those that are enduring great persecution? Obviously, we see here uh, the only ones that will ever be clothed in white are those that have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only blood that can make us holy and right and right standing before the Lord. And um, it's interesting before we, of course, we see that God's going to establish a new heavens and a new earth, the new Jerusalem. We see here that there is this temple. And, um, and this is what's going on right now in, before the throne of God, this picture of, of worship that will one day come to the earth and we will be a part of. So I wanted to say, to say in, uh, in closing, as we look at the, the purposes of the tribulation, in part, I want to draw attention to three things that we already see from what we've seen. Uh, the first is what we saw in chapter 6, uh, verses 16 and 17, that the great tribulation is going to be used to judge the wicked. This is one of the, the purposes of the, tri the tribulation we're going to see in the remainder of the book of Revelation. God is going to bring justice. He's going to judge. As we said, there's a culmination that's coming into an end where God is going to pour out his wrath. Second of all, we see the purpose of the tribulation here also in chapter 7, verse 14. And that is that God wants and desires and there will be a great harvest of souls. God wants people to be saved. So there's going to be a great revival there's going to be a great turning to the Lord from every tribe, tongue, and nation during these years. A great harvest is going to come, and we're going to see that more later of when Jesus is seen thrusting in the sickle to bring the harvest and the order of that, just like he talked about with the wheat and the tares, that the wheat will be gathered first, and then the tares, there'll be another harvest, and it'll be a harvest of judgment. So firstly, the judgment of the wicked. Second, a great revival of, of all tribes, tongues, and nations. And then thirdly, what we saw here also in chapter 7 is that God's purposes for Israel will be fulfilled. And he's going to use this time of the tribulation to fulfill his purposes in this as they are his witnesses in, the, in this time. So those are just some of the things that I wanted to, to draw attention to to encourage us. And I, I pray that there was something in there that um, maybe got your attention more than it had before or to be reminded and uh, maybe some verses for you to consider to go back and study and to see and uh, just get further rooted in this book of the, the book of revelation and these cross references to the old testament so i just wanted to share that it's been an awesome time together and i did i do want to pray before we 
we uh, finish our time together. Let's agree, because it's one thing to read the Word, but we need to pray these truths into our lives. And the Bible says it's clear that if we don't, uh, we don't have because we don't ask. And so we should ask in response to the Word of His revelation.